you for having me. Thanks to Alex and Juan for inviting me today. Um, uh, so I'm going to be talking about my work and my interest in lifestyle interventions in asthma. And first of all, I have no, no uh, relevant financial uh, relationships to disclose related to this talk. And the objectives today are really going to be to think about the existing literature on the connect the association between obesity and clinical inactivity as well in asthma. To discuss some of the um, published lifestyle interventions that are designed to improve asthma outcomes, and also critically appraise the role of these lifestyle interventions among uh, urban minority patients with asthma. So just kind of as a little bit of background of how I kind of got interested into, in this uh, area is really from my clinical experiences of caring for um, patients with asthma in my asthma specialty clinic. So, um, you know, I began really to see um, quite a few uh, patients that were in their um, 30s and 40s that had um, been diagnosed with asthma a few years past and um, noticed that they had weight gain and really wanted to engage in more physical activity, but really had difficulty and had concerns about doing it with their asthma. So that's kind of the background as how I got into the, into, interested in this area. Now, um, a lot of people think of asthma as a disease of children and adolescent, but adolescents, but the, the, the rate of asthma in adults is actually increasing and worldwide, there's about uh, 330 million people uh, living with asthma. And the rates are higher in what we call our developed countries, so the United States, Canada, um, the UK, uh, Brazil, Peru, uh, Australia, and New Zealand all have um, the prevalence of asthma is greater than 10% um, or so for the general population. Now, looking a little bit closer to uh, Home for you guys. Um, I have here this is the U.S. prevalence um, of asthma in adults, which is 7.7, and for the state of New York, is 10, it's about 10%. Um, for uh, in some of the boroughs, though, there are much higher rates of asthma, especially in the Bronx and Staten Island, and uh, the mortality rate is also high in quite a few of the boroughs, including the Bronx. Um, and then looking at the asthma hospitalization rates in adults, again, they're very high among, uh, in, the, in these areas of uh, Bronx and Staten Island. But interestingly, in uh, those patients that are older than 65, the rates of asthma um, hospitalizations are high across um, all areas of New York. So, um, so there is you know, significant um, you know, high, high rates of asthma and, um, here as well in New York as well as Chicago. But, um, so in addition to the um, prevalence of asthma, we know that obesity prevalence is increasing as well. And this is from um, uh, the source of the data from your parents from the CDC. And uh, here it shows uh, from around from 2000 to 2016 that the rates of obesity um, among adults have gone from 30% up to 40%. Now, uh, recently, actually, Alex and Juan uh, published this in um, earlier this year that was actually looking at uh, obesity among asthma, asthma and non-asthma patients. So the top, um, uh, the top panel is in asthma patients, and the bottom panel is in uh, non-asthma patients. And they saw that there was a substantial increase in obesity in the asthma patients. So in this population. Um, the obesity prevalence in asthma has increased over 10% to being around 40%, whereas in uh, the non-asthma patients, it's gone from 20 to a little bit under 30%. And um, so that's almost a 10% difference between the, uh, the non-asthmatics non and the asthmatics. Interestingly, too, this was really augmented in women African Americans and middle um, and older age adults. So um, the prevalence again of obesity and asthma is increasing. So the association between obesity and asthma is kind of a double-edged sword. So we know that um, obesity is a risk factor for asthma, 
So patients that have a BMI between 30 to 35, that they have a 1.4-fold increased risk of developing asthma. And if your BMI is 50 or greater, then your um, increased your risk of, as of developing asthma is 2.5-fold. Um, then also, asthma is a risk factor for obesity. So in pediatric populations, um, mm -hmm. children that have asthma around ages three or four, they have, um, by age eight, they have double the risk of developing obesity. So um, there is this relationship that, that we're seeing here that kind of goes both ways. Now, what are the effects of obesity on asthma outcomes? So I already mentioned, as far as some of the clinical findings, we see this increased risk of incident asthma associated with obesity. But also, patients with obesity have worsening asthma severity, poor asthma control, poor asthma quality of life, as well as a reduced responsiveness to many of the treatments that we offer for asthma, and an increased susceptibility to air pollution. Um, as far as biomarkers, we see increases in leptin, a decrease in adiponectin, and in IL-6 and oxidative stress. And then the lung parameters, we see a decrease in FEV1, a reduction in the functional residual capacity, heat and fire flow. And we actually see an increase in airway hyper-responsiveness, so their airways are more reactive, and a blunted bronchodilator responsiveness, so maybe not as responsive to the bronchodilators themselves. So what are some of the factors that really contribute to this obese asthma syndrome? So some people have termed this um, as obese asthma syndrome. And some of these are environmental exposures. So as I mentioned, um, um, both uh, airway pollution and smoking are independent risk factors in the development of asthma and obesity. Also mechanical factors. So the mass loading on the chest well, that can reduce the um, the functional residual capacity, and that has been associated with this, that increased airway responsiveness. And then both metabolic and immune function, as well as the microbiome, I kind of put those together because alterations in the microbiome can impact immune function, uh, where we've seen increases in eosinophils in the airway um, wall compared to sputum, as well as a decreased um, T cell responsiveness um, in regards to allergic responses. Also, there are comorbid conditions that may also contribute um, to obesity as well as asthma, um, and that includes like GERD, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, as well as depression. And then uh, genetics. So um, studies in um, monozygotic and dizygotic twins have actually shown that there is um, a, there's a, a, the genetic component. There is eight percent that's shared between obesity. And then physical inactivity. So physical inactivity can increase the oxidative stress and um, obviously lead to obesity and has been shown to worsen asthma symptoms. And then finally, diet quality. So there's actually been some work done from Lisa Wood in Australia where they um, gave patients a high-fat diet, and they found that those patients had increased um, airway reactivity and a decrease in uh, lung function, as well as um, as well as um, that blunted bronchodilator response. And interestingly, patients that actually had a high fiber diet; they had the opposite effects. So it's something that diet can have an impact both on asthma and obesity. So I'm going to move on to some of the lifestyle interventions in people with asthma and obesity. So starting off, I kind of want to talk about like what is a lifestyle intervention because that very broad. Um, in general, it typically means an a intervention that includes a component of diet, exercise, as well as like a behavioral component, whether it be at an individual letter level or at a group level where you get group support, either in person, uh, online support, Weight Watchers is, a, is another good example where they get support. Um, but why look at lifestyle interventions? Um, well, lifestyle interventions are effective, and they actually have greater sustainability. The most commonly known one in the medical field, I think, is the Group Lifestyle Balance or the Diabetes Prevention Program, and that has been shown to be effective in reducing the progression to diabetes in pre-diabetics. Uh, but only a few interventions, uh, a few uh, lifestyle interventions, have actually been done in asthma. 
um, despite the problem of obesity and asthma. So the first study actually was done in 2013. So again, this is a pretty early, uh, there's not a lot of research out there because people have only really recently been starting to look at this. So this was uh, published in uh, 2013 and uh, they looked at dietary restric restriction as well as exercise to improve airway inflammation in both overweight and obese um, asthma patients. And so in, they uh, enrolled 46 patients with a range between mild to severe persistent asthma. And with that, their main mean ACQ, and I'm going to be using ACQ a lot talking about that. So that's an asthma control questionnaire that's validated. And um, it's just similar to the ACT, so you can determine like if someone's not well controlled or uh, poorly controlled. So the mean ACQ in this group was, in general, they didn't have well-controlled asthma, and their BMI was 33. And this is a 10-week intervention. And the first group was a low-calorie diet of 885 to about 1,100 calories per day. Um, in the group two was aerobic <coughs> and resistance exercises at a gym at least three times a week, a one-hour personal training session per week, plus a walking prescription with a goal of 10,000 steps per day. And the last group was a combination of group one and group two, where they got both um, interventions. So here they found uh, that um, those patients that lost a minimum of, uh, of 5 to 10 percent of their body weight, that this, this group of patients had a higher, um, had, had a greater number of those that actually had improvements in their uh, asthma quality of life, which is ATLQ, as well as um, an improvement in their ACQ. So this is 0.5% improvement. Um, that's important because that's been defined as the minimal um, clinical importance difference or the MCIB for both of those um, measures. So interesting, those patients that lost more than 10% of their weight loss, while they did have an improvement in uh, lung function, it didn't really confer a bit, an added benefit to uh, their asthma quality of life or their asthma so uh, that suggests that maybe there are some obviously additional factors playing um, a role and it's not just the weight um, entirely because, um, or this was just kind of the, the, the plateau of the dose effect. I'm just curious what else were they given? Were they given like a prescribed meal? They weren't like given meals a, every day or just no. guidelines on how to yeah, take exactly. Yeah. So the second study is uh, looking at, this uh, was published in 2017 in the Food Journal, and this was looking at the role of exercise in a weight loss program and obese adults with asthma. So this, this study enrolled 55 obese, moderate to severe persistent asthma patients, and this group of patients had very poor, had poorly controlled asthma and their BMI was 37, their mean BMI for both groups. And this was a three-month intervention. And in this, they included a behavioral weight loss component, which included 12 individual low diet counseling sessions. So again, they said, okay, try to minimize your calorie, your diet to 1,300 calories per day. They didn't provide food or anything. Um, and these sessions were conducted by nutritionists and psychologists. Um, and then they uh, included either uh, in that they added exercise in one group. Uh, which was the aerobic exercise um, and resistance exercises for major muscle groups two times per week. I couldn't really find in, in their paper whether they had to like come to the you know the, the academic center <coughs> to actually you know engage in the activity or if this was something that they could do at home. And then uh, but so the control group was just the behavioral weight loss plus they gave up sham exercises which were just stretching exercises. Um, and then again, the other group was this, this added exercise. So in this group, they found that in the weight loss plus exercise group, that um, again, a, a greater percentage of patients uh, were able to, uh, to reach um, that minimal, minimal clinical importance difference for asthma control as well as asthma quality of life. Now the mean. Um, Weight uh, percent weight loss in the weight loss plus exercise group was about seven percent, whereas in the weight loss plus plus sham group was about four uh, percent. So um, again, it was kind of falling in between that five to ten percent, 
Um, and um, and so so again, this is just showing how exercise does seem to enhance um, uh, that that improvement in um, the asthma control as well as quality of life. So the last study is uh, a behavioral weight loss study and physical activity intervention, and this was published in 2015. Um, and this by far was the largest study, so this had 330 obese adults with uncontrolled persistent asthma. And here again, the, um, their asthma was not well controlled, and their mean BMI was 37. Um, further, it was the longest intervention to date, with it, this one being 12 months and the other ones being three months or less. Um, and it, this actually was a modified DPP, so they um, used the DPP as a guide and made some um, slight modifications uh, where uh, and they had 13 weekly in-group sessions over four months then two monthly in-person individual sessions and then they had um, three bi-monthly phone consultations and then if a patient wanted or participant wanted more they could have more so they recommended moderate calorie reduction so from their baseline they said Reduce their, reduce their diet by 500 to 1,000 calories per day. Uh, and then they recommended moderate intensity physical activity for at least 150 minutes per week. Now, in this study, they definitely did not have them coming in. They just said, OK, this is what you should be doing um, engaged in that, um, in that activity. So here, um, this is specifically looking at asthma control. They found that in order to um, Get a weight loss of a weight loss of of 10% or greater was actually needed to improve asthma control. So here they were uh, uh, to in order to get that 0.5 change in ACP, they needed that greater than 10% weight loss. Now there was uh, there was a difference in weight loss between the two groups, though it was very minimal. Um, I believe it was uh, about around 5% in the intervention group uh, versus the control group, which was about. Uh, so, um, so there were some changes, but um, not um, uh, large amounts. Now, just as a frame of reference, now for the uh, DPP studies that were done in diabetes, um, in order to see benefits there, they needed only about a three to five percent weight loss. So it's really seeming that for asthma, maybe more than that. Um, so looking at some of the mechanisms of the combined diet and physical activity interventions. So if um, this is a cell that's very important in my field, so it's the eosinophil. Um, and we know that eosinophils um, can, are predictive of greater asthma severity as well as uh, worsening or more frequent exacerbations. So a lot of the two of the studies, two out of the three studies actually looked at eosinophils. And they did look at the change in airway inflammation um, compared to the change in physical activity did see that there was a reduction in the eosinophils based on the amount of physical activity. So those patients that were getting more moderate physical activity had a, uh, had a reduction in their eosinophils. Now the second study, they actually used uh, the fractionated exhaled nitric oxide, which is a marker of uh, eosinophilic airway inflammation. And there they found a significant change um, in the intervention group in, with a reduction of um, levels in, in that population. So it's suggestive definitely that eosinophils probably do have a role in um, this, but I feel like at this point things are still very basic, our knowledge of uh, what are the mechanisms at this point. So a summary of these combined diet and or lifestyle interventions in asthma. Again, um, improvements in asthma control and quality of life are seen, but usually only when at least 5 to 10 percent and that last, that largest study showed maybe even greater than 10% weight loss occurs. Um, many of the randomized controlled trials were really sh short duration, so two out of the three were three months or less. They had different variations in intensity uh, inter in, in the, of the intervention. So if you recall that first one, where they were going to the gym at least three times a week, had an hour personal training session, which would be definitely nice to have, um, but very, I think, difficult to be sustainable. Um, but, uh, and then uh, they also, that first study actually used pretty stringent caloric restrictions, so between 800 and 1,100 kilocalories per day, and that's actually not recommended by the obesity guidelines. They don't recommend eating that very stringent caloric restrictions. 
And as I mentioned, the mechanisms of these interventions are really still, we don't know. In the uh, Jim Ma study, did they do any subsequent analyses stratifying by um, eosinophil? eosinophil? Yes. Yeah, no, they didn't. They didn't to look um, to see if they did, like, between non-eosinophilic yeah. or eosinophilic asthma, yeah. So that would be very interesting. Um, so as, as with any study, we always want to see, like, how applicable is this study or generalizable is this study to our, to our population. The first study was actually conducted in Australia. The second study was conducted in Sao Paulo in Brazil, and the last study was conducted um, through the Kaiser Permanente system in California. So you can kind of see a little bit as far as the background, the majority of these studies were in women, um, and the um, studies in abroad, they didn't really report the racial background of the participants, whereas the California study did show about half the 50% white and then uh, a mix of uh, black Hispanic and Asian. Now, um, only one of these studies, so Sao Paulo is actually an urban city with, um, with I think it's about 12 million people living there, whereas these other ones were more in like suburban or small cities. So as a clinician working in an urban city, I definitely know that there are unique barriers to engaging in physical activity in urban environments as well as um, uh, sometimes uh, also accessing like fresh food. So I'm just going to talk a little bit now about what do, you know about lifestyle interventions among more urban minority patients, of, of which I care for, and I know all of you also care for a similar population. So um, obviously, again, urban environments definitely have an effect on healthy behaviors. Um, and this can uh, range, so there have been studies looking at specifically minority populations, Asian populations, Hispanic populations that live in cities, and definitely there are a lot of environmental factors, so air pollution is one big one. Um, also, um, uh, uh, sidewalks not being kept up, lack of green space in certain areas, uh, violence or concern for safety, so all, those are all... Um, and also areas of light. Um, so all of this is kind of definitely has an impact on engaging in health, healthy behaviors. So again, not only being able to be physically active, but also um, access, you know, accessing healthy foods, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of food deserts, um, you know, even within cities. So I actually decided to kind of focus my work on um, one particular population, which is African American women. And one of the reasons for this is that African American women are less physically active. So they there's less than 15% of them actually meet the, the physical activity guidelines for America, Americans. Uh, they have a poor diet with less um, dairy, as well as uh, fruit, fruit and vegetables. Um, and they have some of the highest rates of obesity. Now, while obesity is definitely, uh, already kind of talked about the impact of obesity in asthma, uh, but I really wanted to focus a little bit more on physical activity, because that, of course, physical inactivity is a risk factor for obesity. And the reason being that is because in asthma, that actually um, is a unique challenge to engaging in physical activity. Um, so I, and because African American women also have some of the highest morbidity and mortality from asthma. That was another reason for me to focus specifically on this population. So I began looking at the literature to see, okay, has anyone already looked at physical activity or obesity and asthma specific to African American women? And no one really had. Um, so, uh, so then I began looking in the literature to see what interventions um, to promote physical activity were there just for African -American American women in general. And this integrative review really found that there were um, quite a few uh, interventions, but the most successful ones were community-based, as well as um, uh, those that really accounted for uh, some of the barriers of childcare and, and other things um, specific to African American women. So with thinking about that, 
I looked again to see where are these interventions taking place in African American women. And the majority of them actually are in the southern United States. There's one in, um, in Missouri. And then the only one that was really urban was actually one in Chicago. Um, that's not why I chose that, but that was, um, uh, that, so that was uh, an interesting um, finding. And really, that program was called the Women's Walking Program. And so this stu the study of the Women's Walking Program, they included 288 um, sedentary urban African American women that were um, middle aged between 40 to 64. And they did not have any major signs or symptoms of pulmonary or cardiovascular disease. So that was really interesting to me, too, that they really excluded patients that had chronic pulmonary disease, such as asthma and COPD. So this was a 48-week walking intervention. And they received a tailored walking prescription based on their baseline um, accelerometer data. They um, met, had group discussions with other African-American women um, to address goals and barriers that happened every five weeks. Um, and then they also, um, in the, some of the arms, they gave them motivational telephone calls that were either automated or they were personalized. So in this study, um, from uh, the, um, in the, at 24 weeks, they found that there was an improvement in um, accelerometer steps as well as aerobic fitness. Um, and then they also found at 48 weeks that they found um, similar findings with accelerometer improvements in accelerometer and aerobic fitness. Now, interestingly, though, they did not see a difference between the, the whether they got the automated telephone calls, the personalized calls, or versus the group, uh, or the group only. So with that, um, it seems that really maybe these motivational like uh, calls aren't really needed. Uh, so just doing a group intervention is uh, was effective again in improving physical activity and fitness. So based on this, I decided to let's see if we could modify the intervention more tailored for African American women with asthma. So so we conducted focus groups, uh, and this included 20 sedentary urban African. American women with a physician diagnosis of asthma, ages 18 to 69. And our focus group guide was, um, we used uh, the COMBI model, which is a theoretical model um, where you're looking at capability, the opportunity, and motivation, and how that affects behavior. So we looked at both physical and psychological capabilities, so asking about their knowledge about physical activity and asthma, action planning, self-monitoring. What are their physical and social opportunities? So what physical resources do they have in their environment? And then we also looked at their motivation, so both reflected and automatic, and specifically looking at beliefs, perceived risks, and attitudes to engaging in physical activity. So with that, the, some of the focus group themes that we found were definitely there was limited physical capacity, so they felt that they, their asthma prevented them from engaging in, in asthma in exercise because it flared up their asthma. Um, there was a lack of knowledge, so a lot of them didn't know that you know active physical activity could actually improve their or help with their asthma symptoms. Um, there was a lack of action planning or self monitoring, so some some of the women, not all, felt that their doctors didn't really provide any advice how to deal with their asthma symptoms either before or after exercise. Um, and then there was complex decision making. So. I thought this was a really interesting quote. So they felt like you had to worry about the time, the day, whether the weather was too warm outside. If it's too warm, your asthma flares up. If it's too cold, your asthma flares up. And you also have to think, did I take all my asthma medication? So I think that's, a, again, this is a little bit unique to, um, to this disease. Um, they definitely felt there were lack of areas to walk, so based on safety. So they felt that their neighborhoods sometimes uh, were safely served um, the south and west sides of Chicago. Um, so uh, these areas, um, you know, well, actually one of the women said, oh, we don't have those nice walking paths that they do on the north side. So, uh, so that was one another thing as far as a lack of area to walk. And then they also said, you know, if there are sidewalks, they're bumps and groups, so they felt like they had to be concerned about their safety and actually potentially falling down. Um, so a lack of social support, so a lot of the women definitely wanted a social partner, which isn't any different than, than other groups, 
But it was interesting because a lot of the women did want, did um, find that they wanted to be in a group with other women that had asthma, um, just because they would understand um, potentially like if they needed to stop and use their inhaler or um, maybe some limitations in what kind of physical activity they were doing. And then the last one was a belief about consequences. So one thing that was really interesting is that almost a quarter of the women that were in our focus groups either had experienced um, a, a near fatal asthma attack or they had had a, a, a friend or family member in their lives that had died of asthma. So it really seems like when they're talking about exacerbation, their fear of exacerbation, it's not, oh, I'm gonna just need to use my nebulizer a couple times. It's ta We're talking about intubation and death that they are have in their minds about exacerbations of asthma. So it's really, you know, not, it's, it's a hard life to live. That's, I, you know, take that from that quote. So based on um, the, our focus groups, we actually modified the intervention, that women's walking program. And um, so our intervention components were, we actually did a 36 week walking intervention instead of the 48 week just because of funding limitations, <laughs> essentially. Um, and our intervention, so both groups, the control and got an educational session on exercising with asthma, so we were able to hopefully address some of the, again, the barriers that the women identified in the focus groups. And we also gave them a fit, Fitbit charge HR. And then the intervention group received that Taylor walking prescription as well as they attended the group discussions with other African American women with asthma to discuss their goals and barriers to physical activity as well as um, uh, and that every four weeks. And we added a group walk because a lot of the women said, again, they wanted to walk with others. Um, and then we did do motivational text messages three times a week, again, to address some of the barriers uh, regarding uh, that, that complex decision making. So we would send them information about like high pollen counts and um, um, if it was cold outside to wear a scarf or to pre-treat with albuterol. Uh, so, uh, and then we also motivational text messages regarding their uh, their step goals. So we would say, okay, you were close to meeting your step goals four times a week last week. Let's try to you know work a little bit harder. Uh, and then we gave them a participant manual that had educational materials, and this included places to walk um, when they uh, when it was cold outside. So indoor places like the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, they have. Oh, they open up early and people can walk, and that's located on the south side of Chicago, so that's an opportunity. Plus, we talked about proper walking shoes, proper walking, um, you know, clothing, um, and how to layer up in the winter. Uh, so, as well as um, information, just again specific to asthma about about pretreatment. So. The goal of this um, of this pilot intervention is really to assess the feasibility and acceptability of our what we call action intervention, which is physical activity in minority women with asthma. So our, again, our study design, uh, we had three um, data collection visits at baseline, 24 weeks and 36 weeks. And uh, after the first baseline data collection, um, participants were randomized either to that enhanced care um, and or the action intervention which I really described the components. So um, we were able to enroll 53 uh, sedentary urban African American women with asthma that had suboptimally controlled asthma and we used the ACT to determine that. Um, six women withdrew, two completely withdrew from the study um, and four actually entered um, with you from the intervention, um, but they did complete uh, outcome uh, visits. And some of the reasons for those withdrawals were, uh, were with time. That was a big thing that some of the women felt that maybe they didn't realize how much time would, um, would it, the intervention would entail. Um, actually, one woman, because um, didn't feel safe going to actually one of our locations, she had some partial blindness and uh, was concerned about the safety because at the beginning we had the study took place in Chicago Park District location. Um, and then, 
those were mainly all the, the things as far as like the withdrawals. So these are just some of our baseline characteristics of our patients uh, in the control and intervention group. And overall, we had a middle-aged population, though we did you know, have it from 18 to 70. Um, an obese population with a BMI of greater than 35. A uh, low-income population, so more than half um, had a household income less than 30,000. Um, and most of them did have, uh, were receiving either Medicare, Medicaid, or some sort of governmental assistance. Um, the patients did have early obstruction. This was just a pre-bronchodilator, so we did not do a post-bronchodilator. Um, and then they did, I, I would say there are somewhat high utilizers of care with um, about 25%, um, you know, over a quarter of them on needing unscheduled or ED visits for their asthma in the past six months. So looking at um, um, the actual intervention pre and post at uh, 24 weeks, we saw in our control group no change in the asthma control, but in the intervention group we did see an improvement. So a lower number is shows that their asthma is more controlled. Um, now it approached that minimal clinical important difference of 0.5, but didn't reach it. Um, as far as asthma quality of life, again, uh, there was like very minimal improvement in the control group, but in our intervention group, we did actually see an improvement in their asthma quality of life from 4.66 to 5.24, which is greater than, um, than that uh, 0 0.5. Um, we did not see an increase in steps, which was a little disappointing, um, and we measured that by accelerometer, not by the Fitbit, um, and then um, really not a lot of change in moderate physical activity minutes per day and over 70 30 minutes um, per day. Interestingly, they really spent not a lot of time in moderate physical activity for like less than 1% of their day where they actually engaged in a moderate, moderate physical activity. Um, now, we're just kind of, we just finished data collection, so this is kind of like our first, you know, uh, look at the data, and we're now in the process of kind of looking at different um, uh, analyzing it in a few different ways to see like those women that actually reached their step goals, maybe they had a better improvement in um, physical activity as well as um, asthma control. So much more to come on that. But in general, we did, again, find it feasible to conduct as well as um, acceptability. We did um, do some acceptability measures through Likert scales and it was acceptable. It was very acceptable by the participants. Um, Including the location, which uh, which we ended up doing at our health at our health system, and um, they liked the content and the group session in general. So some of the lessons learned and next steps um, are: we did find, though, I did say that of the women that came, um, that they really did like the face-to-face -face group meeting, but they can be difficult to attend, and a lot of the reasons that we found were transportation issues. Um, as well as child care issues. We did not provide child care um, and actually really encourage the women to take this time for themselves and try to, you know, kind of get away from, I don't want to say get away, but really try to take that time for themselves to focus on that. Um, How well attended were the, uh, uh, the, the walks after the in-group? Yeah, so we actually didn't do it after, we did it in the middle. Oh. Uh, so, oh, okay. so, so, yeah, so everyone, yeah, meeting. exactly. So it was kind of nice because our meetings were two hours long. Uh, so it's like everyone's sitting for an hour, and then yeah. we said, okay, we're going to take a walk for 15 minutes, uh, and then we would finish up the last 45 minutes. So it was kind of nice in the middle. Um, so definitely some of the things that we're thinking about for next steps are, you know, can some of these be done, like, remotely um, on the phone? Um, or video conferencing, and we actually did a lot of our makeup sessions that way. Um, so if somebody missed, we uh, used Skype or um, or telephone. Um, so a lot of the women really felt that they needed at least one or two sessions to kind of get to know the group and feel comfortable with the group, but maybe um, like sessions three and four that they can maybe be done uh, remotely just to provide a little bit more flexibility. But it was interesting, though, too, some of the women actually said, well, you know, if I if we do 
to that. I might be more likely to multitask or, you know, not really, again, take that time to themselves. So they did really like, again, that evening. So it definitely seemed, you know, something not to completely get rid of, but maybe modify a little bit. So another um, um, lesson learned was we need to increase the engagement between sessions. So we used, as I mentioned, the Fitbit charge, and we played around too with um, utilizing, there's a community, a Fitbit community, I don't know how many of you are on Fitbit, um, but you can create your own group. So we tried to create our own group, and try, and a lot of, some of the women, one of the cohorts actually challenged each other, so they gave up work group challenges to see, like, could they meet X amount of steps. Um, so that was something that they enjoyed, and at least within, uh, between the monthly meetings, that they could still engage with each other. And there are interventions, uh, physical activity or lifestyle interventions that have been done looking at um, using like Facebook. So it's something that has been utilized um, with some success. But no one has ever really used this Fitbit community before. But it's something that we're considering. How did it work out with the Fitbits? Did people hold on to them? Well, yeah, I can, uh, I'll, I can definitely talk about uh -huh. that. Yeah. Way to that. So the Fitbit. So, um, so I, I put all three of these on here because when I started my study, there was a charge HR. By the time I finished the study, there was the charge three. So all, you know, even over like 18, it was about 18, 20 months, there were three iterations of the same, of essentially the same device. So they're always changing them. Yeah. So, you know, one thing was, okay, a lot of the women were like, oh, I want one of those fancier ones, you know, uh -huh. um, and, you know, obviously, you know, study budget limitations being what they are, uh, sometimes you can't always do uh, that. Uh, we did find um, definitely some women, uh, so the Charge HR isn't waterproof, uh, it's like very like limited water resistant, I believe, I know the Charge 3 now is waterproof, so uh, actually I think the Charge 2 is too. But, so that was one complaint. Some women did have a little irritation, so again, we're dealing with a more allergic population to begin with. So some of them did have issues with the band or lots of different colors. Some of them did break. Actually, we didn't really have too many that were lost. Um, and we did let the women keep these. So we said, OK, I mean, they were wearing them for six months. And um, or actually a total of nine months. Yeah. But so and what we found is typically after nine months, Again, there's going to be a new version out there, <laughs> so it's not really worth saying, like, oh, we'll give you a Fitbit and we'll turn it after that. That's pretty much going to be obsolete. Yeah. Um, now, um, additionally, some of the issues that you just really have to consider, instead of saying, oh, we're just going to get Fitbits and give them to people, so you, you do have to do quite a bit of training of your staff, um, of the patient themselves. Um, kind of have like a hotline because definitely issues came up, came up like, oh, my Fitbit's not syncing. Um, oh, the Fitbit app was deleted. They logged out of our study. Um, you know, we had to create emails for them, for the study participants, so then you can create a Fitbit account. That would be a study account. And, and a lot of people already have Fitbits, so that kind of sometimes got confusing when we gave them the study Fitbit, and then they already had their own Fitbit. So it's not as easy as, again, just saying, like, oh, we're going to give you a Fitbit. And actually, some of the women that you know were very difficult, like especially in the control group, that were very difficult to get a hold of. Sometimes there was like one or two participants we just mailed them their Fitbit and just gave them instructions or packet, and some of them really never even wore it. So, so it's they really do need some of that. Yeah. What yeah. is the price on this? Um, so the char they're about one hundred and fifty dollars each. So yeah, I mean sometimes maybe during sales, and Fitbit does offer. I think a, a, a discount to academics, but it's not, it's like maybe no more than 20%. Oh. So, yeah, yeah, but if you um, can definitely reach out to them and let them know. Um, the other thing, too, was uh, that the women indicated was really to provide more opportunities to walk together. So, again, we did have the group walking at during the group, uh, during the every four week sessions, but there were uh, there are other opportunities that we've now thought of to maybe incorporate. So Girl Trek is actually um, led um, by, it's specifically for African American women, and it's all around the country. And um, we were looking this up yesterday. They have you know walks that you know either happen every Saturday or yeah. um, you know, and they could be all around like the city 
I know in Chicago they have some monthly events or so this would be a, provide an opportunity <laughs> if we could get kind of the women to sign up together too to, to do some of these walks. So Girl Trek is an option. Um, a lot of the patient advocacy organizations, I know in Chicago, the Respiratory Health Association and the American Lung Association have events like the Hike for Lung Health or Hustle Up the Hancock, other things like that that, that could be a, providing an opportunity. And then I recently found out about a program that was uh, started in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, <laughs> which was Walk with the Doc. So it's, again, kind of you can find uh, walk, walks where a physician would walk with you for an hour um, and, you know, potentially to talk about some educational topic and something that people can start wherever. Um, so those are other opportunities to potentially consider to really pro to get them to walk more and not just think, of, oh, we're going to walk at the session. So the girl track, they have a, a walk. Central Park on Saturday morning, and you just put in your zip code and it tells you where the local walk is. Um, it's a girl track. It's girl track. track. Yeah. yeah, you just go online, type girl track. track. Yeah, it's really it's a great resource. You know, yeah. if you want to get any new patients. Mm -hmm. so you just do a walk. Yeah, yeah it's nice. Um, and then, um, so really, just kind of some future considerations to wrap up. Um, really, we do need some well designed and, and uh, interventions that provide sustainable delivery options. Um, and the mechanisms of these interventions still are needed. And we just kind of, to your point, we need to include some of these populations, even especially if we're looking at physical activity, activity not only looking at the obese, but maybe the non obese, the eosinophilic versus the non eosinophilic, and looking at other coexisting medical conditions because we know. We don't have that many adults that come in just with asthma. <laughs> um, and um, and then also long-term RCTs that really assess maintenance. So that's another thing that a lot of these studies like haven't really looked at the effects of maintenance. Now the women's walking program, they've actually done maintenance studies um, actually three and four years out, and they have shown some sustained increases in what in steps. Yeah. So that is you know definitely promising with the and just some uh, clinical take-home points. So again, to try to get back to, you know, when we are seeing patients in clinic, really just thinking that patients really are interested in maybe hearing about these lifestyle interventions for asthma, um, really talking to your asthma patients and setting goals, um, and really also trying to find out what are those unique barriers that they may have to physical activity with asthma. So again, talking about albuterol pretreatment, making sure that they have that albuterol inhaler, Trigger avoidance. Oh, all, almost all of our group sessions always ended up talking at some point about triggers. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a big thing um, as far as, and especially in an urban setting with uh, a lot of our patients being in public housing, that there is a lot of issues with uh, with their with their homes. Um, safety uh, as and I think that those were like the main barriers that we think of more particularly with urban environments. So I'd just like to thank um, everyone here. Again, thanks for inviting me and um, my mentors, advisors, collaborators, um, and then definitely our participants. Uh, and that's it. So I'd be happy to take any questions. For your intervention, did you, <clears throat> did you adapt it to displays over time and did you change the number of messages or the kind of messages or? Um, we didn't, for the text messages, we didn't do a lot of changes there. Um, that, you know, we did, with the text messages, we did, prior to starting the intervention, we did kind of vet it with some African-American women um, and also our nurse interventionist who was an African-American woman with asthma. So we didn't do a ton of changes with that. Um, some of, we did get feedback like, oh, they really, really love like the pollen count updates and everything, especially you know during the spring, summer, fall. Um, so that was something that we may have used a little bit more, kind of based on that feedback. But um, but yeah, that was um, that that was that's a good point, you know, as far as being able to tailor some of those things. We did again kind of tailor the the group sessions to incorporate a bit more asthma content. So obviously, initially, there was no asthma content in there. And while we did that, 
that uh, physical activity and asthma session at the beginning for everyone, they still wanted more asthma stuff. So we included it. Um, we actually made videos with an asthma educator, and she would talk about certain topics. So we did like like cleaning supplies, like doing green cleaning supplies, and we also talked about uh, um, again like just different triggers, uh, how to use inhalers properly, the difference between the controller and the uh, um, rescue. So, yeah, um, so they really liked that, so we kind of definitely listened to them about wanting that more asthma content and provided that for them. So. Is there um, much in the way of promotion, you know, some kind of active promotion of physical activity happening in primary care practices in terms of like, organized walks and you know, instead of just you know simply talking about it, but actually um, you know taking groups of patients out, you know whether it's asthma or diabetes mm -hmm. or other conditions. I am not familiar. I mean, the only thing would be that that walk with a doc, where some yeah. I think organizations yeah. are kind of doing that. I mean, those are more kind of like on weekends, it's again yeah. Saturday mornings yeah. or every other Saturday, those types of things. So I think. Those are some some thoughts. Um, I know that there is. I know some people are doing some work on do, in primary care at UCSD where they are trying to use like exercise prescriptions, yeah. um, like electronic prescriptions yeah. that maybe that physicians can provide to patients. But otherwise, yeah. I haven't really heard too much of studies of that. So. Yeah, so definitely, you know, as again, our we had a very low income population, so definitely some of them did go to the did go to a gym, and there's I don't know if you guys have it here, but there's like something called Planet Fitness, and it's like seven dollars a month or yeah. something, and they're popping up more in the south and west sides of Chicago. So that's something that we do talk about, but um, and then also the Chicago Park District. Um, you can get a prescription for like a physician can write a prescription, and someone can get three month free membership it's pretty small but um, but that that is you know so we did provide some of those resources uh, as far as like letting people know about them we didn't actually provide gym memberships but some of the studies that have been done in physical activity and asthma they did that said okay we'll give them a three month membership um, to a gym but cost is definitely a big um, is a big factor in I was just telling Alex that we um, did a survey to the Quad AI, which is the Allergy Society, um, about physical activity. And I was looking over the data last night a little bit more. And interestingly, that was a big concern from a lot of the physicians is the cost of, you know, of, of being like referring them to a gym uh, for their patients. So that's why walking is a great a great exercise. And we do talk. We do talk with the women about again those indoor resources that can be low cost or free. You know, one of them is, um, you know, we would tell women, you know, go to Costco or go to Walmart and don't even grab a cart. Like walk around a couple of times before you even um, before you even like pick up your cart. And a lot of women you know, did that. And they, that said, oh, too, you know, I bought a little bit less, or I was able to kind of look around and see exactly what I needed and what I didn't. So, I mean, there are definitely indoor resources. Um, I mean, I think still we need to know a little bit more about what intensity is going to be required of, of physical activity to actually result in the changes of asthma control um, and quality of life. So, so if that walking is going to be enough or how much they need. So, but yeah, I mean, definitely it's difficult in this population.
characteristics are, but so there's funding for gym membership and like to go to the gym and everything. So I'm going to try to keep track of that and down exactly what we can message out. But we can, uh, you know, we can still hold rules for the same way for the players and such to program. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do not have that vacancy. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, uh, so YMCA of America is based in Chicago, so uh -huh. I know some people there, and it's really interesting because they say that definitely the different YMCAs have different focuses, so that's great that they have that, they were saying it's like Metropolitan, like YMCA of Chicago, really is just focused on youth programming, and uh -huh. they don't really care about the DEP, so it's really interesting just the local uh, you know, organizations, how they can but yeah, definitely the YMCA is a great, you know, potential partner. Um, but we definitely have to like, find the right environment. So, yeah. 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 Thanks, yeah. Thank you so okay, much. Okay. Thank you.